The Chessmen of Mars. Chapter 13. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Tom Weiss. The Chessmen of Mars by Edgar Rice Burroughs. Chapter 13 A Desperate Deed. Emed crossed the tower chamber toward Tara of Helium and the slave girl Lan O. He seized the former roughly by a shoulder. Stand, he commanded. Tara struck his hand from her and, rising, backed away. Lay not your hand upon the person of a princess of Helium, beast, she warned. Emed laughed. Think you that I play at Jitan for you without first knowing something of the stake for which I play? he demanded. Come here. The girl drew herself to her full height, folding her arms across her breast, nor did Emed note that the slim fingers of her right hand were inserted beneath the broad leather strap of her harness, where it passed over her left shoulder. "'And Otar learns of this you shall rue it,' Emed cried the slave girl. "'There be no law in Manator that gives you this girl before you shall have won her fairly.' "'What cares Otar for her fate?' replied Emed. "'Have I not heard? Did she not flout the great Jeddak, heaping abuse upon him? By my first ancestor I think Otar might make a jed of the man who subdued her.' And again he advanced toward Tara. "'Wait,' said the girl in low, even tone. "'Perhaps you know not what you do. Sacred to the people of Helium are the persons of the women of Helium.' for the honor of the humblest of them would the great Jeddak himself unsheath his sword. The greatest nations of Barsoom have trembled to the thunders of war in defense of the person of Dejah Thoris, my mother. We are but mortal, and so may die, but we may not be defiled. You may play at Jitan for a princess of Helium, but though you win the match, never may you claim the reward." If thou wouldst possess a dead body, press me too far. But know, man of Manator, that the blood of the warlord flows not in the veins of Tara of Helium for naught. I have spoken. I know naught of Helium, and Otar is our warlord, replied Emed, but I do know that I would examine more closely the prize that I shall play for and win. I would test the lips of her who is to be my slave after the next games. Nor is it well, woman, to drive me too far to anger. His eyes narrowed as he spoke, his visage taking on the semblance of that of a snarling beast. If you doubt the truth of my words, ask Lano, the slave girl. He speaks truly, O woman of Helium, interjected Lano. Try not the temper of Emed if you value your life. But Tara of Helium made no reply. Already had she spoken. She stood in silence, now facing the burly warrior who approached her. He came close, and then, quite suddenly, he seized her and, bending, tried to draw her lips to his. Lano saw the woman from Helium half turn, and with a quick movement jerked her right hand from where it had lain upon her breast. She saw the hand shoot from beneath the arm of Emed and rise between his shoulder, and she saw in the hand a long, slim blade. The lips of the warrior were drawing closer to those of the woman, but they never touched them, for suddenly the man straightened, stiffly, a shriek upon his lips, and then he crumbled like an empty fur, and lay a shrunken heap upon the floor. Tara of Helium stooped and wiped her blade upon his harness. Lano, wide-eyed, looked with horror upon the corpse. "'For this we shall both die!' she cried. "'And who would live a slave in Manator?' asked Tara of Helium. "'I am not so brave as thou,' said the slave girl, "'and life is sweet, and there is always hope.' "'Life is sweet,' agreed Tara of Helium, "'but honor is sacred. "'But do not fear. "'When they come I shall tell them the truth, "'that you had no hand in this.' and no opportunity to prevent it. For a moment the slave girl seemed to be thinking deeply. Suddenly her eyes lighted. 
"'There is a way, perhaps,' she said, "'to turn suspicion from us. "'He has the key to this chamber upon him. "'Let us open the door and drag him out. "'Maybe we shall find a place to hide him.' "'Good!' exclaimed Tara of Helium, "'and the two immediately set about the matter Lano had suggested. "'Quickly they found the key and unlatched the door, "'and then, between them, they half-carried, "'half-dragged the corpse of Emed from the room "'and down the stairway to the next level.' where Lano said there were vacant chambers. The first door they tried was unlatched, and through this the two bore their grisly burden into a small room lighted by a single window. The apartment bore evidence of having been utilized as a living room rather than as a cell, being furnished with a degree of comfort and even luxury. The walls were paneled to a height of about seven feet from the floor, while the plaster above and the ceiling were decorated with faded paintings of another day. As Tara's eyes ran quickly over the interior, her attention was drawn to a section of paneling that seemed to be separated at one edge from the piece next adjoining it. Quickly she crossed to it, discovering that one vertical edge of an entire panel projected a half-inch beyond the others. There was a possible explanation which piqued her curiosity and acting upon its suggestion she seized upon the projecting edge and pulled outward. Slowly the panel swung toward her, revealing a dark aperture in the wall behind. "'Look, Lano!' she cried. "'See what I have found! A hole in which we may hide the thing upon the floor!' Lano joined her, and together the two investigated the dark aperture, finding a small platform from which a narrow runway led downward into Stygian darkness. Thick dust covered the floor within the doorway, indicating that a great period of time had elapsed since human foot had trod it, a secret way, doubtless unknown to living Manatorians. Here they dragged the corpse of Emed, leaving it upon the platform, and as they left the dark and forbidden closet, Lano would have slammed to the panel had not Tara prevented. Wait, she said, and fell to examining the door frame and the stile. Hurry, whispered the slave girl. If they come, we are lost. It may serve us well to know how to open this place again, replied Tara of Helium, and then suddenly she pressed a foot against the section of the carved face at the right of the open panel. Ah, she breathed, a note of satisfaction in her tone, and closed the panel until it fitted snugly in its place. Come, she said, and turned toward the outer doorway of the chamber. They reached their own cell without detection, and closing the door, Tara locked it from the inside and placed the key in a secret pocket in her harness. Let them come, she said. Let them question us. What could two poor prisoners know of the whereabouts of their noble jailer? I ask you, Lano, what could they? Nothing, admitted Lano, smiling with her companion. Tell me of these men of Manator, said Tara presently. Are they all like Emed, or are some of them like Akor, who seemed a brave and chivalrous character? They are not unlike the peoples of other countries, replied Lano. There be among them both good and bad. They are brave warriors and mighty. Among themselves they are not without chivalry and honor, but in their dealings with strangers they know but one law, the law of might. The weak and unfortunate of other lands fill them with contempt and arouse all that is worst in their natures, which doubtless accounts for their treatment of us, their slaves. But why should they feel contempt for those who have suffered the misfortune of falling into their hands? queried Tara. I do not know, said Lano. Agor says that he believes that it is because their country has never been invaded by a victorious foe. In their stealthy raids, never have they been defeated, because they have never waited to face a powerful force, and so they have come to believe themselves invincible, and the other peoples are held in contempt as inferior in valor and the practice of arms. Yet Akor is one of them, said Tara. He is a son of Otar, the Jeddak, replied Lano, but his mother was a high-born Gatholian, captured and made slave by Otar, and Acor boasts that in his veins runs only the blood of his mother, and indeed is he different from the others. His chivalry is of a gentler form, 
though not even his worst enemy has dared question his courage, while his skill with the sword and the spear and the thoat is famous throughout the length and breadth of Manator. "'What think you they will do with him?' asked Tara of Helium. "'Sentence him to the games,' replied Lano. "'If Otar be not greatly angered, he may be sentenced to but a single game, in which case he may come out alive. But if Otar wishes really to dispose of him, he will be sentenced to the entire series, and no warrior has ever survived the full ten, or rather none who was under a sentence from Otar. "'What are the games?' I do not understand, said Tara. I have heard them speak of playing at Jitan, but surely no one can be killed at Jitan. We play it often at home. But not as they play it in the arena at Manator, replied Lano. Come to the window, and together the two approached an aperture facing toward the east. Below her Tara of Helium saw a great field entirely surrounded by the low building and the lofty towers of which that in which she was imprisoned was but a unit. About the arena were tiers of seats, but the thing that caught her attention was a gigantic jitan board laid out upon the floor of the arena in great squares of alternate orange and black. Here they play a jitan with living pieces. They play for great stakes, and usually for a woman, some slave of exceptional beauty. Otar himself might have played for you had you not angered him, but now you will be played for in an open game by slaves and criminals, and you will belong to the side that wins, not to a single warrior, but to all who survived the game. The eyes of Tara of Helium flashed, but she made no comment. Those who direct the play do not necessarily take part in it, continued the slave girl but sit in those two great thrones which you see at either end of the board, and direct their pieces from square to square. "'But where lies the danger?' asked Tara of Helium. "'If a piece be taken, it is merely removed from the board. This is a rule of Jitan, as old almost as the civilization of Barsoom. But here in Manator, when they play in the great arena with living men, that rule is altered,' explained Lano. When a warrior is moved to a square occupied by an opposing piece, the two battle to the death for possession of the square, and the one that is successful advantages by the move. Each is caparisoned to simulate the piece he represents, and in addition he wears that which indicates whether he be slave, a warrior serving a sentence, or a volunteer. If serving a sentence the number of games he must play is also indicated, and thus the one directing the moves knows which pieces to risk and which to conserve, and further than this a man's chances are affected by the position that is assigned him for the game. Those whom they wish to die are always panthons in the game, for the panthon has the least chance of surviving. Do those who direct the play ever actually take part in it? asked Tara. Oh, yes, said Lano, often when two warriors, even of the highest class, hold a grievance against one another, Otar compels them to settle it upon the arena. Then it is that they take active part, and with drawn swords direct their own players from the position of chief. They pick their own players, usually the best of their warriors and slaves, if they be powerful men who possess such, or their friends may volunteer, or they may obtain prisoners from the pits. These are games indeed, the very best that are seen. Often the great chiefs themselves are slain. It is within this amphitheater that the justice of Manator is needed, then? asked Tara. Very largely, replied Lano. How, then, through such justice, could a prisoner win his liberty? continued the girl from Helium. If a man, and he survived ten games, his liberty would be his, replied Lano but no one ever survives, queried Tara. And if a woman? No stranger within the gates of Manator ever has survived ten games, replied the slave girl. They are permitted to offer themselves into perpetual slavery if they prefer that to fighting at Jitan. Of course, they may be called upon as any warrior to take part in a game, 
but their chances then of surviving are increased, since they may never again have the chance of winning to liberty. But a woman, insisted Tara, how may a woman win her freedom? Lano laughed. Very simply, she cried derisively. She has but to find a warrior who will fight through ten consecutive games for her and survive. Just are the laws of Manator, quoted Tara scornfully. Then it was that they heard footsteps outside their cell, and a moment later a key turned in the lock and the door opened. A warrior faced them. Has seen Emed the dwarf? he asked. Yes, replied Tara. He was here some time ago. The man glanced quickly about the bare chamber, and then searchingly first at Tara of Helium, and then at the slave girl, Lano. The puzzled expression upon his face increased. He scratched his head. It is strange, he said. A score of men saw him ascend into this tower, and though there is but a single exit, and that well guarded, no man has seen him pass out. Tara of Helium hit a yawn with the back of a shapely hand. The Princess of Helium is hungry, fellow, she drawled. Tell your master that she would eat. It was an hour later that food was brought, an officer and several warriors accompanying the bearer. The former examined the room carefully, but there was no sign that aught amiss had occurred there. The wound that had sent Emed the Dwar to his ancestors had not bled, fortunately for Tara of Helium. Woman, cried the officer, turning upon Tara, you were the last to see Emed the Dwar. Answer me now, and answer me truthfully. Did you see him leave this room? I did, answered Tara of Helium. Where did he go from here? How should I know? Think you that I can pass through a locked door of skeel? The girl's tone was scornful. Of that we do not know, said the officer. Strange things have happened in the cell of your companion in the pits of Manator. Perhaps you could pass through a locked door of skill as easily as he performs seemingly more impossible feats. Whom do you mean? she cried. Turan the Panthon? He lives then? Tell me, is he here in Manator unharmed? I speak of that thing which calls itself Gek the Kaldane, replied the officer. But Turan, tell me, Padwar, have you heard aught of him? Tara's tone was insistent and she leaned a little forward toward the officer, her lips slightly parted in expectancy. Into the eyes of the slave girl, Lano, who was watching her, there crept a soft light of understanding, but the officer ignored Tara's question. What was the fate of another slave to him? Men do not disappear into thin air, he growled, and if Emed be not found soon, Otar himself may take a hand in this. I warn you, woman, if you be one of those horrid corfuls that by commanding the spirits of the wicked dead gains evil mastery over the living, as many now believe the thing called Gek to be, that lest you return, Emed, Otar will have no mercy on you. What foolishness is this? cried the girl. I am a princess of Helium, as I have told you all a score of times. Even if the fabled corfuls existed, as none but the most ignorant now believes, the lore of the ancients tells us that they entered only into the bodies of wicked criminals of the lowest class. Man of Manator, thou art a fool, and thy Jeddak and all his people, and she turned her royal back upon the Padwar, and gazed through the window across the field of Jitan, and the roofs of Manator through the low hills, and the rolling country, and freedom. And you know so much of Corfels then, he cried. You know that while no common man dare harm them, they may be slain by the hand of a jeddak with impunity. The girl did not reply, nor would she speak again, for all his threats and rage, for she knew now that none in all Manator dared harm her save Otar, the jeddak, and after a while the Padwar left, taking his men with him. And after they had gone, Tara stood for long looking out upon the city of Manator, and wondering what more of cruel wrongs fate held in store for her. She was standing thus in silent meditation when there rose to her the strains of martial music from the city below, the deep, mellow tones 
of the long war trumpets of mounted troops, the clear, ringing notes of foot soldiers' music. The girl raised her head and looked about, listening, and Lano, standing at an opposite window, looking toward the west, motioned Tara to join her. Now they could see, across roofs and avenues, to the gate of enemies, through which troops were marching into the city. "'The great jet is coming,' said Lano. "'None other dares enter thus, with blaring trumpets, the city of Manator. It is Uthor, jet of Manatos, second city of Manator. They call him the great jet, the length and breadth of Manator, and because the people love him, Otar hates him. They say, who know, that it would need but slight provocation to inflame the two to war. How such a war would end no one could guess, for the people of Manator worship the great Otar, though they do not love him. Uthor they love, but he is not the Jedi, and Tara understood, as only a Martian may, how much that simple statement encompassed. The loyalty of a Martian to his Jeddak is almost an instinct, and second not even to the instinct of self-preservation at that. Nor is this strange in a race whose religion includes ancestor worship, and where families trace their origin back into remote ages and a Jeddak sits upon the same throne that his direct progenitors have occupied for perhaps hundreds of thousands of years, and rules the descendants of the same people that his forebears ruled. Wicked Jeddaks have been destroyed, but seldom are they replaced by other than members of the imperial house, even though the law gives to the Jeds the right to select whom they please. Uthor is a just man and good, then? asked Tara of Helium. There be none nobler, replied Lano. In Manitos none but wicked criminals who deserve death are forced to play at Jitan, and even then the play is fair and they have their chance for freedom. Volunteers may play, but the moves are not necessarily to the death, a wound, and even sometimes points in sword play deciding the issue. There they look upon Jitan as a martial sport, here it is but butchery, and Uthor is opposed to the ancient slave raids and to the policy that keeps Manator forever isolated from the other nations of Barsoom. But Uthor is not Jeddak, and so there is no change. The two girls watched the column moving up the broad avenue from the Gate of Enemies toward the Palace of Otar, a gorgeous barbaric procession of painted warriors in jewel-studded harness and waving feathers, vicious squealing thoats caparisoned in rich trappings, Far above their heads the long lances of their riders bore fluttering pennons, foot soldiers swinging easily along the stone pavement, their sandals of citatar hide giving forth no sound, and at the rear of each utan a train of painted chariots drawn by mammoth citatars carrying the equipment of the company to which they were attached. Utan after utan entered through the great gate, and even when the head of the column reached the palace of Otar, they were not all within the city. I have been here many years, said the girl Lano, but never have I seen even the great Jed bring so many fighting men into the city of Manator. Through half-closed eyes Tara of Helium watched the warriors marching up the broad avenue, trying to imagine them the fighting men of her beloved Helium coming to the rescue of their princess. That splendid figure upon the great thoat might be John Carter himself, warlord of Barsoom, and behind him Utan after Utan of the veterans of the Empire, and then the girl opened her eyes again, and saw the host of painted, befeathered barbarians, and sighed. But yet she watched, fascinated by the martial scene, and now she noted again the groups of silent figures upon the balconies no waving silks, no cries of welcome, no showers of flowers and jewels such as would have marked the entry of such a splendid, friendly pageant into the twin cities of her birth. "'The people do not seem friendly to the warriors of Manitos,' she remarked to Lano. "'I have not seen a single welcoming sign from the people on the balconies.' The slave girl looked at her in surprise. It cannot be that you do not know, she exclaimed. 
Why, they are... But she got no further. The door swung open, and an officer stood before them. The slave girl, Tara, is summoned to the presence of Otar the Jeddak, he announced. This is the end of The Chessmen at Mars, Chapter 13. Recording by Tom Weiss.